series. Sorry that we weren't here last week. Uh, Brother Dave will get these two, and it's one page front and back, okay? I, I remembered this time to do the right thing on the printer. Also, if you want a copy of Study 2, which was two weeks ago, I have some of them available up here. I didn't print any of Study 1, but if you ask me, I can get that for you. Uh, study 2 is two pages. I did not get the backs printed on them, okay? Uh, we are looking at just a few of the ideas of our basics, what, what it is that makes us who we are. And when I say us, I'm talking about our tribe. And our tribe is the Assemblies of God, but beyond that, Pentecostal charismatic churches. That, that's the tribe we're in. And I want to show you tonight that we talk a language that each of us understands. A, a number of months ago, maybe before the pandemic, I read to you an assessment in a Sunday morning message. It was a study conducted. It was actually commissioned by the Catholic Church in Latin America. And they had one of their theologians do a study. Why is the Pentecostal church growing in Spanish-speaking countries at the expense of the Catholic church? Now, we're not going to argue tonight about whether people in Catholic churches are born again or not, because they could argue are people in Pentecostal churches. The truth is, we don't know who is truly born again and who isn't, but that person does. Would we agree? Right? That's between you and the Lord. That's between me and the Lord. We, we see fruit and evidence. But generally speaking, the Catholic Church in Latin America, because of its blending cultural animism, and sometimes the occult, oftentimes gangs, all of that being blended with Christianity. And the Catholic Church has never been shy about, in my opinion, their confession that they often will come in, and let's say uh, 500 years ago, coming into different parts of the world and just taking the culture and adopting it in the Catholic Church and Christianizing it. All right? Whether that's good or not, I can't say tonight. But they've been fair game. Can I just say that? And I think you understand what I mean when I say that in much of the developing world, for the Pentecostal church, when they say, let's go do a street meeting, let's go preach the gospel, they would be aiming at people who go, go to no church, but they would also be aiming for people who are in church but not worshiping, in church, but not born again. And so many of those who came into Pentecostal churches in Latin America in the last hundred years came out of Catholic churches. All right, fair or not, that's how it happened. So the Catholics commissioned a guy uh, just a few years ago, within the last 10 years, and he came back, and here's what he said. The Pentecostals, and I don't have it in front of me tonight, but you can look it up or I'll, I have it in my notes somewhere. The Pentecostals are divided in their own thinking about each other. The Assemblies of God and the Church of God and the Foursquare and the Pentecostal holiness. And, and then you can throw in all of the Jesus-only churches, UPC, United Pentecostal Church, the Apostolics, if you're down in West Virginia or up in Michigan, those were apostolic churches. If you're in the black church, apostolic has a different meaning. But nevertheless... The consensus among them is they're divided. But he said the truth is they're the most united group on the face of the planet. And he listed ten reasons. And it was just like, hey, that's us. That's us. Oh, yeah, that's us too. I get to see this often when I'm doing events overseas because we have a couple of requirements. You have to be at least three or more organizations working with our crusade, or you have to be 50 individual churches. So for me to come to your city and do a crusade, there has to be a cooperative effort, and that takes 50 churches of any stripe or at least three organizations. So I get to see this all the time. And it's phenomenal, right? I'll come to a crusade, start working together. It's Church of God, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal Holiness, and a thousand others. In Tanzania, they have an organization called the National Pentecostal Fellowship of Tanzania. And that's not the exact name, but it represents 80 organizations. 
All right? So we're talking about what is that? What, what makes us that? Is it the name? Uh, well, we don't have it on the sign, and we got, I got criticized for that. The Assemblies of God Church, the Assemblies of God Central Church of Cumberland? Is it the 16 tenets of faith that we share that then can be distilled down to four cardinal doctrines? And they are Jesus Christ is Savior, Healer, Baptized in the Holy Spirit, soon coming King. All right? It's just that simple. When we talk about what makes us who we are, what we are, it, it comes to that, that point of saying, um, what, what, do we, what are we banking on? What are we holding to? Because just as President Lincoln said, the South and the North both read from the same scriptures. We read from the same Bible as the Methodist and the Baptist. So what is it? First study we did together, and I've got kind of a little bit of a review here for you on uh, the beginning page at the beginning of the study tonight, the what and then the why. And we talked about the what being kind of shared among all believers. Everybody who says, I have eternal life because I believe in Jesus Christ. We're one big group, and those are considered to be evangelicals. I have eternal life because of my faith in Jesus Christ, not because I got baptized, not because I took communion, not because I joined the church, not because I am a good person. All of that strikes you out from being evangelical. Evangelical is I have heaven as my destination. I have confirmation in my spirit because I of my faith in the work that Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And he is the son, the only begotten son of the father. Amen? Okay, so that kind of makes us like, well, we're similar. And, and the way we looked at that first building or the, the foundation of our house, the four walls. Now, we're, we're going to think of this as a very simple house, as basic as you can get. Four basement walls. All right, And we talked about those because they were the first words of Jesus in each of the four Gospels. Then we looked at the walls, the first story, or the main story walls of our house, four of them. And we found those in the first references to the Holy Spirit in each of the four Gospels. We found out that those showed up before the first words of Jesus in each of the Gospels. Wow. That's important, isn't it? So, hey, we're going to close out. If we're going to close out, we need to go to the end of each of the Gospels, right? And we need to see what the end of the message is in each Gospel. What did Jesus say to us before he left? So let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Pentecostals believe in not only the availability of an experience in the Spirit, but also the availability of a life aligned with the book of Acts and all it describes. So what we're talking about tonight is, okay, now we're going to put the roof on. And this is a, um, a hip roof. So it's got four. It doesn't, it's not like this, just two, two slants. It's four. Each of our walls comes up to a point. Okay, so we've got four foundation basement walls. We've got four walls on the living level, the second story or main living level. And we've got four, I hate, my fingers are not working. Right? Four, not three, four sections of the roof. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to finish our house. Amen. And you can decorate it any way you want. Put any kind of carpet in, shag, pile, cut, I don't care. But here's how we're going to finish out the roof tonight, right? Matthew chapter 28. And look at verses 18 to 20. And some of this will be up on the screen for you too. Jesus came and told his disciples. Now, if you're looking in your Bible, you should see that Matthew ends with this passage, number one. And number two, it's in red. Because Jesus, if you have a red letter edition, Jesus is speaking. Amen? I love that about Matthew. The last thing... and. This is not a, in any way a negative about the other Gospels. But if I were writing a Gospel, 
I think if it's about Jesus, he should get the last word. Amen? That's just my thought. Well, Pastor, that, you didn't have anything to do with it. Well, that's true. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. You might want to make sure you've got that marked. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The King James says even to the end of the world, I believe. The new living to the end of the age. And that's kind of it. The Greek implies that there's a, a time of harvest, a time for the church, and that comes to a close. Hallelujah. Okay, so we want to notice four things here. Number one, all authority has been given to who? Who? <clears throat> I have been given. Uh huh. Yeah, sure, I get it. Yeah, by extension then to us as well, yes. But just very first, we want to make sure that we understand that the Bible declares, now the world doesn't agree with this. Governments don't agree with this. Facebook does not agree with this. But Jesus says he has received all authority. Now that came from who? To Jesus from the Father, from God, right? Uh, you could also say it came from his work on the cross. It, it, it could be that you say it came from his blood, from the resurrection. Uh, Paul makes the, the point in Colossians that he did all of this, the disarming of the powers of darkness on the cross. So you could do any of that. But uh, in my blank there, I've, I put the Lord Jesus, okay? And then two, the Holy Spirit is equally at work. When Jesus said, baptize them, I understand the importance of baptism. I, I'm not diminishing that when I said earlier, we are not those who say I have eternal life because I was baptized. When I was eight years old and got into church, that's the church we attended. That was the teaching. When you are ready to be a part of the kingdom, when you make your profession of faith in baptism, then you are saved. There may be some truth to that. You can find some scriptures. But in essence, what it was saying was, I, I do something, and then God saves me. And as um, evangelicals, we struggle with that. But I'm not saying that it's, there's no merit to it or no truth to it. Number three, our doctrine is simple. And that's from the third part of this. Teach these new disciples to do what? To obey the Lord Jesus. You know that's our doctrine? To obey the Lord Jesus, that's really it. You know, I was thinking about the other day, as we're reading through Leviticus. How, how, are any of you reading right now? Oh, yeah. Huh, isn't that exciting, Leviticus? Wow, how much work was that? Cut the wood, bring the wood, bring the water, cut the, kill the animal, bring that animal, kill that animal, change your clothes, change your clothes again, put the old clothes on. Oh, blood's flying everywhere. And then the one whole chapter, you sin and you don't know it, you're still guilty. You didn't know you were even sinning about this, that, or the other, you're still guilty. I don't care. I don't need you to know. I know and you're guilty. Well, how do I know I'm guilty? I, you don't know. It doesn't matter. Bring a sacrifice anyways. And throw it up there in the altar. What are you waiting on? Hurry up. Wow, it's burdensome and oppressive. But in all of that, please. Yeah. Then he killed him. Then he said to Aaron, don't you cry. Get your other two in here and carry their dead bodies out. I noticed today it said they grabbed him by the garments. They couldn't touch him, couldn't touch a dead body, or they'd have been defiled. Don't make a mistake. It was, it was a brutal faith. Somebody, um, yeah. 
Yeah, this is honestly one of the blessings of reading the Old Testament and reading Leviticus is to say, wow, thank God in heaven for this new covenant, this new plan for bringing us in. And listen, when Paul talks about the mystery, the great mystery was not all that Jesus did, but that the Jews would allow the Gentiles to come and worship. That, that's a big deal. Can you imagine being Jewish and getting saved and people like us walk in and say, you did what with all those animals? Well, forget all that. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm saved. I just, I just met Jesus and it's all fine. You've spent a lifetime trying to figure out if God was happy, mad, or ready to strike you dead. And here's some jerk Gentile just rolling down the street, oblivious to all that, and saying, I'm just like you. I'm just as close to God as you are. Oh, wow. Thank the Lord that the church survived all of that. Amen? Okay, so our, our focus is on obeying the Lord Jesus. Yes. And what I was thinking about as I've started reading through Leviticus was how every, every religion, and I'm reading this book still that I told you about a while back. It's about after, or excuse me, near-death experiences. It's not a Christian book, and I don't recommend it to you, so I'm not going to tell you the title. But um, what I find fascinating is all of these people had these same experiences. And the author's talking about how wonderful it is because they all found this amazing love and they didn't want to come back, but none of them crossed all the way over either. And I always think, you know what? I really don't want to hear from any of you. I want to hear from somebody that went actually into God's presence. I don't want to hear from all of you who got to the gates or got to the edge or were halfway into the tunnel and then got pulled back. I, I really don't care. I need to know somebody that went to God, showed up, and then came back and said, uh, let me tell you how you make it. Do you know the only person that that applies to? Jesus. Yeah. And when we think about what we're supposed to be seeking, and I know this, but it's becoming a little bit more uh, meaningful to me as I read Leviticus. Holiness. Nothing else, no religion, not even Christianity, can give you, be careful that you hear how I'm saying that. True faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that can produce holiness and a desire for holiness. And I know that's not exciting either. That's not much more exciting than the book of Leviticus. But that's the goal. That, pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. So I'm reading this book where all these people, I mean just, you know, the worst of the worst, and they got into the tunnel and they saw the light and they were just overwhelmed by love. And They, they come back and they're, they're a little bit improved, but many of them, the studies have shown that most of them are less religious or even, they say they're less religious but more spiritual, but they're less Jesus-centric. I can tell you that. Every one of them. I find that very interesting. No marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, the Bible says. Most of them see relatives. Now, I'm not talking nobody in the book yet, and she has interviewed dozens of people and lots of professors and doctors who also themselves had these experiences, but none of them that she has talked to were born-again, spirit-filled believers before they had this experience. Those people are out there, and we've heard some of them in our church, but not in her book. And so I thought it was very interesting that from all these different backgrounds, they had all the same experience, and they're all convinced they're fine. And I want to say, I want to, say to a lot of them, so you're, um, you're pretty sure that when you really die all the way, you're gone, right? Oh, yeah, 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 I've never been more sure in my life. Then I want to go down a list of people that I know they can't stand. And I want to say, based on what you're teaching, all you have to do to get there is breathe. You don't have to have faith, religion, sanctification, holiness, nothing. doesn't matter. Matter of fact, you're better off if you don't have religion. So you're telling me, and I'm going to go down this list, if I know they're a real liberal, politically persuaded person, I'm going to say, so President Trump's going to heaven right beside you. If they're really conservative, then I'm, I'll go after some, you know, President Biden. <laughs> Ultimately, gang, Jesus says something here to us that I think is very profound. This is Matthew's text. He, he, he's, 
conveyed to us everything he believes is critical in the last words of the Savior before he returns to heaven. And this is the assurance, the fourth thing, the assurance. Be sure of this. I am with you always. And so I wrote, he is with us. Right? He is with us. Okay, Mark's closing is spirit-centric, maybe even more so. Go to Mark chapter 16. I wrote this one out for you because I wanted you to see it all, even if you don't have your Bible with you tonight. Like Matthew, he captures kind of one statement. Now, his gospel is very compact, high energy, high intensity. And you notice in the New Living, they've got some footnotes in there or subheadings about uh, controversy over these endings. But I don't think there's any need to consider this ending controversial. Verse 15, and he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. And that's the verse that my church as a kid hung everything on right there. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new tongues or new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. And you say, yeah, all right, yeah, right, okay, hallelujah, amen. Now let me ask you something. You name me one other organization, group, or tribe that reads that and says, all right, let's go. You name me one other Christian fellowship, church, denomination, organization, parachurch group besides the Pentecostals who read that, who have that read to them in church or in their gathering, and they say, oh, that's terrific. I can't wait. How many of you sitting here in this church tonight as I read that, how many of you said, oh, oh what in the world? Why, why would he even read that? I, that? That's for back then. That has nothing to do with us today. I don't know if any of you, none of you that are connected felt that way. It wasn't even a feeling. It didn't rise up in you. Sister Linda? Sure. Ah. Right. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Your word says.
Amen. Right. It's for today. Right. Amazing. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now listen, we don't understand all of this. We're not Jesus. Even spirit-filled. Paul said in Corinthians that there, there's still even a limit. You know, we prophesy in part. And, and we don't understand everything, how it works. In the moment... When the anointing comes on you and you know that the Spirit of God has said, trust this verse, claim this passage, you know it. But later, all you can say is glory to God. But here's here's my point. You come into this building, and if I read that verse, you're not intimidated, you're not upset, you're not shaking, like, oh, no, what's that? And what's going to happen? You just come in and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. Because there's an atmosphere here of the work of the Holy Spirit. We're cool with it. We, we don't have to know how it's working. We'll step back and assess it. We're going to test the spirits. We're going to uh, uh, assess the, the uh, witness of the word of uh, uh, prophet, or excuse me, tongues and interpretation. Those public gifts, yeah, we're going to be a little bit mindful about them and not let them get out of control. But ultimately, we're good with this. We're fine. You know, it doesn't shake us. We don't have to see these things 24-7. I don't have boxes of snakes up here under the pew to test you, to check out how you're doing. We don't have to prove our faith by this stuff. No, none of that. But as a Pentecostal church, we're like, yeah, those, those. Isn't this part of the Great Commission? So what I want you to see, what are, we, what are we putting on here? The roof of the house, right? This is what ties the structure together. And so the first thing we saw was the Great Commission. Matthew says Jesus, the last thing he said was go. Go into all the world. So what you're going to see is this commission built and fleshed out in each of these Gospels. So no one of them gives you the whole picture, but together you get the picture. And the first thing Jesus said, you got to go. That's how Matthew's angle looks. The second thing is, when you go, you're going to need some stuff when you're going. Because you're going into places where you may think, as an American, well, I'm going to go and tell them about Jesus, and they're going to be levitating off the floor. And you're going to be saying, well, that's not possible. And this... uh, which doctor is going to say, why don't you go back home to where you belong until you're ready to, to do war and battle in the big time places you're not really needed here. And that's happened to more than a few people. So Jesus is saying, listen, you're going to go up against some things and you have to know, number one, you're sent. Number two, you're empowered. Being sent is just part of it. Yeah. Praise God, we're sent. But how are we sent? We're sent with power, praise God. Power in spiritual places. Paul said there's that wickedness, you know, in heavenly places. And we don't have to do battle uh, uh, based on advertising or cultural battles. We do battle in the spiritual realm. Okay, let's go to um, Luke. Here's the next question I have there. So the second side of our roof is a very clear statement that ministry should be with powerful signs and supernatural confirmations, right? Why is that important? Well, I just told you at least part of it. Why else is that important? Why is it important that ministry be done with power? It's a sign to the unbeliever, absolutely. Breaks strongholds, right? Satanic strongholds. 
brings confidence, confirmation, brings um, uh, a calmness as well, just an assurance. Oh, wow, this is, you know, I, I was preaching in Pakistan a couple of years ago, and in, in the one event in particular, I, remember look, I just remember looking out and thinking, these folks are all religious, and all I'm doing is bringing them another spiritual option. But when the Holy Spirit started moving, it was much more than an option to them. It was a manifestation of the kingdom of God among them. I was able to step out of the way and and God began to move. That's that's transformative. All right? It it confirms the word of God. You know, it's not just confirmation to the person that's listening, but it's also confirmation as it goes out. God's word is honored by signs and wonders. God's word is so powerful and so alive, it produces real stuff. Amen? And you could put other things there as you think of them. In Luke, we find directions from the Lord Jesus as to exactly how this is to be accomplished by us. Okay? So 24, 47 through 49, if you're there in your Bible. It was also written, I didn't, I didn't get the whole text of what he's saying, but I, I want to capture it from 47 on. It was also written that this message should be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. Again, you see the harmony between the three so far. This is about what the church is to do after his ascension. And we are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We are to have it operating in us, the gospel operating in us with signs and wonders, and we are here in Luke to take this message proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Oh, that's the gospel. Praise God. You are witnesses of all these things. Now, I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Praise God. Now, remember that. If you don't have it memorized, try and cram it in there real quick right now, okay? Or keep your finger there and just kind of hold to that thought because we need to understand what's happening here and then what happens In John, our message is to be that there is absolute forgiveness available. You can write it that way, or you can, and I want you to see how important this is, because John, the fourth gospel, brings a bow tie on this. The gospel message is that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. And it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. I don't know if two plus two equals four. I'm not sure today that it does. <laughs> but I am absolutely tr- sure that all who repent have forgiveness of sins. They don't have to bring a ram, Brother Harold. They don't have to have the priest build a fire, cut the wood. They don't have to have it all washed off in the great bowl out front. They don't have to memorize, bring the salt offering, and sin offering, guilt offering, peace offering, shame offering. Crazy offering. All they have to do is repent. That's tough enough, but repent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Proclaiming this message takes supernatural power, but not of any spiritual source except one, and that is, Jesus said, stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from where? Heaven, on high. Yeah, on high. Two distinctions here. It's the Holy Spirit, and if you're still curious as to whether the Spirit you're dealing with is holy or not, He comes from heaven. He doesn't come from the earth. He doesn't come from a faraway galaxy. He doesn't come from the darkness, the abyss, the pit, or hell. He comes from heaven. Because there are a lot of people that believe that they're involved in the most exalted spirit or the highest manifestation of their spirit guide and all of that stuff. But Jesus gives us two concrete descriptions here. Holy Spirit from heaven. So there's no confusion, right? That's the source. Okay. Uh, 
I hope you all can hear that. When I was in Bible school, one of the arguments that we bantered around was, who is the Great Commission for? Who's called to go to all the world? And the end of that argument is every believer. Now, are we all sent to the same extent? No, obviously not. Are we all gifted in the same way? Oh, thank the Lord, no, or that would be a mess, wouldn't it? But are we all called to that purpose? Yes. And so sending from the Lord Jesus Christ means that somebody actually goes. A lot of other people make provision so they can go. There's curriculum. There's media. There, you know, yes, but we're all working so that the gospel can go out. We're not working so that people can come to Central. We're working so that the gospel can go out. So that people can be rescued. Jesus wants people to be rescued. God is not willing that any should perish. In Ezekiel, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Isn't that in Ezekiel? Yeah, where he's arguing or he's talking to Ezekiel. And uh, over and over, God demonstrates his passion to save people. But there has to be on the part of the people a desire to repent. Amen. But is it just for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers? No, it is not. It is for all of us. And that's how we used to preach in Pentecost that everybody needs an experience with the Holy Spirit because everybody is called to the Great Commission. Amen. That's why. Okay, go to John. We're running out of time tonight. Go to the end of John. Now, there is what is considered by most to be an epilogue, chapter 21. In your New Living Bible, it's even identified as the epilogue because the end of the book, the gospel, really takes place in 30 and 31. But I want you to see that because there are words of Jesus in the epilogue as he interacts with John and Peter in that conversation. And, but his commissioning, his great commission, as John gives it to us, is here in verses Uh, Let's start in 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we need to take a few moments here because at face value, this seems to be somewhat contradictory to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It also seems to be contradictory to the book of Acts, especially chapter 1 and chapter 2. What is this? What's happening here? So one of the things that we see is that Jesus focuses again on being forgiven. He says to his his people, when you are out involved in the Great Commission, if you forgive their sins, they're forgiven. Whoa, wait, wait, whoa, time, time out. Whoa, I can come around and say to you, "Your your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. Now obviously that doesn't, isn't supported by the other texts, right? But what is supported is when you confess, when you repent, I can say to you, I have assurance based on God's word. And I want to give you that assurance that your sins are forgiven. I can, I can tell you that. When I lead you in a prayer to, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ and you say, I confess to you, I'm a mess. I'm a pretty good mess. You know, I mean, my life isn't nearly as bad as everybody else, but nevertheless, I know I've sinned or I've whatever, strayed this way, offended that way, but I've sinned. When you do that and you say, Jesus, I trust you as my intercessor, my Messiah, my Savior, my Deliverer, and no one else, you're the Lord, would you save me? I can say to you, I guarantee you, you are absolutely forgiven. You don't have to go get the best of your flock. You don't have to become a member of the church. You are forgiven. Now that bears witness with the rest of the scriptures, right? 
that what he's doing is giving his servants confirmation that when they pray with somebody, when they minister to somebody, and that person asks forgiveness, the church can say to them, the church can say to them, your sins are forgiven. Not just the priest, but the church can say that. And Jesus is saying, I'll back you up. So what does does the previous statement or, or experience convey to us? He breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, do you think that that's the same as what we read in Luke 24? We read in Luke 24, Jesus said, Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until, the King James says, until you be endued with power. I think the New Living says, until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Is it the same? Sister Jane, you think it is? Do you believe that this, and let me rephrase it then, okay? Is it the same as Acts chapter 2 when they were in the upper room and the Holy Spirit came? Because I, I didn't phrase it the way I wanted to. I put reference, I'm asking you if it is synonymous with what Jesus promised in Luke 24, and that's not, that's not what I want to say. Is it synonymous with what happens in Acts chapter 2? Now the answer, right? I did a better job there. The answer is no. It can't be because Acts chapter 2 takes place later. Right? So it's not the same thing. Now let's think for a moment. One of the things that we noticed in our last study was that when the Holy Spirit was talked about in the Gospels, in the beginning of each, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it was in a in a way that you and I could understand. The Holy Spirit will come. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. The Holy Spirit and fire. He will. He will do that. And we talked about people under the Old Testament. Zechariah, Elizabeth, John the Baptist. All dying under the Old Testament covering. Then we talked about those involved with Jesus And the New Testament, Mary, who even though she was the central figure in the nativity prior to the birth of Jesus, she did not experience what Elizabeth and Zechariah did. She did not experience what John the Baptist did. For some odd reason, she was not allowed to have that. But we see her in Acts chapter 1 with the 120 in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come just as Jesus promised. Ha, so here we come to moving in to this experience. Who can receive the Holy Spirit? Who is a candidate? Jesus promised in Luke 24, he promised the Father will give you this gift. The Father, I will give you the promise of the Father. Who's a candidate? Who can receive the Holy Who cannot receive the Holy Spirit? Unbelievers, sinners, unconverted unregenerated, right? Now, you and I would all say that the disciples have known Jesus, right? As they journey with him, they've known him. Do you think they've made a statement of faith or have had a heart transformation and have said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins? Yeah, most likely, but they have not had yet the New Testament resurrection, internal, personal experience that can only come from meeting Jesus as resurrected Savior. So when he breathes on them, what he's, in my opinion, and others, what he's doing is showing everyone else as we read it. I don't mean everybody was outside the doors. But as we look at this, we see him saying to those first followers, new life, salvation. They don't have to make a statement of repentance because they've done that at some point. But nobody has yet accessed him for the receiving of the forgiveness of sins. And what I believe you're seeing right here is that. Just what he's saying. I breathe on you. I'm giving you new life. 
And anybody else who does what you've done follows me, obeys me, seeks me, repents, and believes on me. When they do that, you can say the same thing to them that I've said to you. Receive the Holy Spirit. You can say life, eternal life is yours. So I just want you to understand that, that, yeah, there are some people who believe this is the experience of the disciples receiving the promise of the Father. But look back for just a moment at Luke 24. Uh, My Bible kind of just jumps there. It was written, verse 47, that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. That's the message. You are witnesses of all these things. Now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. That phrase and the, what we would expect from that, we don't see in John. If the Holy Spirit's coming from heaven and there's going to be a visitation of power, I would think there would be some evidence. Let me give you an example. A little lady knocks on her cousin's door. Her cousin, six months pregnant, opens the door. Pow! There's power. And both of them speak prophetically. Oh, what's the mother of my Lord doing here? Mary says, from this moment on, all nations, all generations will call me blessed. The Holy Spirit has definitely arrived and something happened. When we read it in John, the Holy Spirit arrives internally. Yes. Yeah, a unique one. And he had the Holy Spirit without measure, John said. Without measure. Now, I've heard people say, you and I have the Holy Spirit without measure. (laughs) You might think that of yourself. It's not true of me, okay? So, yeah, Jesus has a unique experience, of course. Um, We're not... Yeah. Was there an encounter when Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, when, when the crowd yes. Well, um, yeah, there were some. I'm not. We'd have to look at the wording. Okay, go ahead. What's your? I'm trying. No, no. I'm just saying that when you're talking about John not saying that there was uh, definitive indication, like Jesus coming from heaven. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I got you. Okay. But uh, I should say that I'm referencing just this text in John 20. When, When the Apostle John captures the scene of Jesus breathing on them, we don't see any power manifestation. Is that fair? But now go to Luke 1, or excuse me, Acts chapter 1, and we'll close with this. Acts chapter 1. Yeah. He knew exactly what they were going to be claiming that they did. Right. He had done that with the devil himself. True. He had just conquered death, hell, and the grave. Right. He knew what, he knew what they, we were going to be up against. Right. And of safety and numbers. And yeah. So yep. Think, uh, Unity. Right, right. It is discerning what we're up against. Okay, Acts chapter 1 and look at verse 4. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized With the Holy Spirit. So when John the Apostle closes out his gospel, Jesus is there, breathes on them, and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. I think you could also 
take that as Jesus saying, receive new life. Then when we come to the book of Acts, Luke refers back to the close of his gospel. He refers to the statement of Jesus, and he says, Jesus, when he was with them, said, you will receive. The implication being, I'm with you to tell you I will not be there when you receive. The implication being, before I ascend, I make the promise. After I ascend, I fulfill the promise. The implication being, you need new life. I give that. But when I go to my Father, you're going to get power because you need that too. Amen? So there's a distinction here between what happens when he's with the disciples and what happens once he ascends. It's different. And so here in Luke, or excuse me, Acts chapter 1, Luke says, quoting Jesus, he was eating with them. He commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift uh, of the Holy, uh, the gift he promised, as I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now remember, Jesus says that, and then John said the same thing, only backwards. He said, listen, I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And the emphasis being on my ministry here on earth is done, but my ministry in heaven is about to begin, and I will be interceding for you. The Bible says in Hebrews, he lives forever to make intercession for us. And in that capacity, his ministry goes on. He continues to pray, but the power comes from the Holy Spirit. So can I drink water? Yes, and that water then has been internalized. I can still also be immersed in that water as well, right? And so I have water in me and water around me, and it's not the same thing. And I can have the Holy Spirit residing in me. This is a poor analogy, crude, but there's no analogy that works except to say the Holy Spirit works within you to do certain things, what you would say, mediation, making the blood of Jesus Christ effective assuring your salvation, confirming the word of God. But he works out through you in power to touch people, to minister to people, to stand on the promises of God until your healing comes. What we read in Mark doesn't say, well, it happens right now or forget it. It just says this will happen. And when the Holy Spirit tells you, hold on to this, this is your promise, then you hold on to it. You can keep taking the medicine. You can keep seeing the doctor. And you can keep holding on to that promise. He's my healer. The Holy Spirit is going to do this work. Amen? So what I want you to see is exactly what Jesus wants us to see. The Holy Spirit has something for us. He has more than just, oh, it's good to be in church. Oh, it's good to have salvation. All that's fine, but the Holy Spirit has something for us that makes life exciting, that makes life engaging, that makes life full of the power of God. Well, pastor, why don't we see more healings, and why don't we see more signs and wonders, and why don't we this, and why don't we that? Um, Listen, we all know the answer to that, And we don't really want to talk about the answer. So let's just leave it at that. right? God's not wrong. His word isn't wrong. And there are places in this world where it's happening. A lot. All the time. But we want to see it here in America too. And we also want 400 channels of cable. And we want phones, brand new iPhone 12,000. We want the best car that weighs... Four million pounds and cost $12 zillion. We want air conditioning and heating. We want the best clothes, the best food. We don't ever want fast. We don't want to pray all night. No. (laughs) So we know, right? But we want to say, well, it's not our fault. It's God's fault. (laughs) I I caution you. Don't ever say that, okay? Okay. Who, uh, who has a question tonight? Or another comment. You guys have had great, great input tonight. And I hate that some of you are sitting far away, but I still welcome, welcome your comment. This is what makes us different. It's what makes us a threat. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah. The indwelling being salvation. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit being sealed, as Paul would say, being confirmed, you know, to use a Catholic term. And I don't mean that in their sense. I mean it in heaven's sense. Absolutely. This is the beginning of people being born again. This is the beginning of the church. This is the beginning. Oh, some people say the church was born in Acts chapter 2, but uh, whatever. This is Jesus saving people and the Spirit of God making them his own. Yes. So that's what goes in. And then Acts chapter 2, what we see is that going out. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes us in our tribe, the Pentecostal tribe, we're not very, we're not very alike. Uh, the mainline church doesn't like us. The unsaved people don't like us. All the other religions, the atheists, nobody likes us, but we stick together. Now, we like all of them. Hello? Right? Because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We're, we're not, listen, the, the, the liberal poli- political people can hate me, conservative people can hate me, but I got nothing but love for you. I'm confident where I'm going when I'm dead. Brother Mandela? Right. There have been um, countless arguments over the last 2,000 years as to what does the baptism of the Holy Spirit look like and sound like in the life of a believer. And we're about out of time tonight, so I don't want to dig into it too deep because I won't be able to answer all the questions. But I've, I've positioned myself in the last number of years to always start from this place. Do you have an experience with the Holy Spirit? And are you growing in that experience? Then I'm going to talk about semantics and why. And I'm not going to talk about my experience first. I'm going to talk about the scriptures first, just as you did. Kudos, Brother Mandela, for going there. And you're right, the Ethiopian, we don't, we don't see that follow-up. And we wonder if Philip, um, what, what follow-up would take place after the Holy Spirit pulls him away. It's pretty incredible that we see him translated, but we don't get to follow, see the follow-up with him in the Ethiopian. We also read about the Apostle Paul himself in Acts as he is blinded, you know, basically living under a curse because of how he's treating the people of the Lord and his encounter with the Lord. And when Ananias prays for him, the scales fall off. He is born again. He breaks his fast. And yet we don't read anything about I think it says he was baptized, but it does not say spirit baptism. And yet this is the same Apostle Paul who in Corinthians says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. So you know, how do we reconcile those things? Well, we go to the book of Acts and we see those five places there where they either did speak in tongues or it's implied that they did. And then we take that and we say, okay, God, are you trying to tell us that there is in most Pentecostal organizations, Assemblies of God, Church of God, the initial physical evidence? And uh, we'll talk about that. If you guys want to dig into that a little bit, uh, we can go there over the next week or two and talk more uh, specifically about it. But... Well, here's what I want to caution everybody. Don't let your personal theology build walls. Don't let your fear, 
your experience, what somebody else said. Don't do that. I go back to what I say is always my first stance. Do you have an experience, a personal experience with the Holy Spirit, and are you growing in that? Because if you are, any wall that you've put up over the course of years or any wall that Satan tries to put up won't stand. It'll fall. And as you're in that, because here's the thing that happened to a lot of Pentecostals, they, they came into a personal experience being baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and they never went beyond that. And so that's it. They feel just like the person who's saved feels like, well, there's nothing more. They've gone to that point, and they feel like there's nothing more. No, there's a lot more. A lot more. You know, when I'm around Dr. Paul I, and he's telling me about praying in tongues on some days, four hours or six hours, I, I want to know what's happening there. I, I want to I feel that. I, I want to see what that is. So we have to be careful that no matter how rich our experience, that we haven't found that as an end point. Have an experience with the Holy Spirit. If you don't feel like you have to your satisfaction, don't play mind games. Well, I go to church and I talk to the Lord all the time, so I don't care what anybody else says, this is it. Don't play that game. It's not about what anybody else says. It's about you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's never going to run out of things to give you. He's gracious. His gifts are rich, plentiful. Let him. Let him. And no matter how dry your experience was yesterday, it can be rich today. He's got surprises. Come on, stand with me tonight. We're really late. I apologize. Brother Mandela, thank you. Good question. All of you, just great participation tonight. I didn't walk today. The last two days I walked out at Rocky Gap with um, my Carhartts on and hiking in boots, literally like work boots. It was just wow. But it was glorious. When you can look a mile down the road and you, you don't see any footprints, you know nobody's going to interrupt your prayer time, right? Hallelujah. You can let it fly. I didn't see any beavers or deer. I saw where the deer had been, but man, I was just like, this, this is heaven. If it wasn't 20 below zero, I'd just say to the Lord, let's just stay here forever. But um, listen, that richness is something we have to crave. We, we just have to crave it. And uh, we'll talk more about it. And actually, it's not even something. We've come to this place where we're studying about it, but we're just not, we're not able to provide the atmosphere. We're going to. We're getting there. I felt like up until this Sunday, for two weeks, we started having uh, great energy in the altar. I felt like I was kind of clear on what I was trying to do. I felt like you were clear on what was happening and Father, thank you tonight for some time in your word, God. But more importantly, or just as important maybe, I don't want to be in error in how I say it, but God, give us time in you, experience in you, Lord. May our passion be for the Holy Spirit, and may the richness of knowing him, Lord, cause us to be brought into realms that we have never known. Paul said he was caught up to heaven and heard things that nobody can utter, can't even be spoken, Lord. John was caught up to heaven and told, don't write down what you just heard. Lord, bring us into those places where it's a language that, that we can't even express because it's just reverberating in heaven. It's not some spirit from darkness, some spirit from the pit. It's not a familiar spirit. It's not an unclean spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, and he is from heaven. Glory to God. Not from this earth, not from this life, but from heaven. I pray for my brothers and sisters tonight, Lord. God, cause our church to revisit Pentecostal experience again. Not because it's doctrinally part of who we are. Not because it's historically part of who we are. Give us that because it's who you are, Lord. It's because what you have for us. And Lord, because we're missing out. Thank you for the passion of those in Asia and Africa. Thank you for the passion of those in Latin America. People just running after you. And Lord, we're heading into a time. We're in a time here in America. And we've got the opportunity to run after you. And we're going to do it. Bless my brothers and sisters tonight in Jesus' holy, holy name. All of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. I love you and the Lord. Have a beautiful night. I'll see you on Sunday.